Welcome to the last part of my Unitail crash course. Yes, you've heard that right. I know many of you want more, but I've been wanting to properly end this series for a while now. It's been a part of my life for almost two years, and I want to work on other projects, like video games. But before I do, I want to help you move on without my guidance. I have a feeling that people are often left helpless after finishing a tutorial series, not knowing what to do next. As a result of that, this video will not be a step-by-step -step tutorial, but rather an insight into how I approach challenges as a programmer. That way, you might be able to proceed, even without my videos. Since this is the last part, I decided to dedicate it to the most requested topic, Gaster Blasters. They are the perfect opportunity to introduce libraries to you as well. So for the last time, let's dive right in. Before I tried out the first library, I put on some background noise. This helps me relax and makes it easier to work. Good preparation is very important, so make sure you've got an environment where you can actually get work done. For my background sounds, I've been using My Noise. It's a website with plenty of different soundscapes and no annoying ads that interrupt the experience. Give it a try if you feel like it. With the preparation done, the first thing I did was to Google Gaster Blaster Library Unitail and start clicking links. The first link led me to this Game Jolt page, where I downloaded a zip file from. I checked its contents and immediately recognized the folder structure of a typical CYF mod. So I copied it into my mods folder and tried it out. What's important to mention is that I didn't change anything about the mod to see if it works out of the box. If you modify stuff immediately after adding it and it doesn't work, it can be tricky to determine whether your changes broke something or if the thing just didn't work at all. When you're learning something new, it's best to move one step at a time and take things slow. The mod contained one wave which showcased the different ways Gaster Blasters can be used, which was useful to see. Since the library didn't have any documentation, I decided to look through the code to figure out what functions were available and how they could be used. The interesting scripts turned out to be the wave script and, of course, the library script itself. Luckily, the wave file was commented quite well, even though some comments were rather redundant. Still, they helped me understand the library a fair bit. This goes to show that even just a few sentences can go a long way, even for a seasoned professional like me. At this point, I got a little lazy and decided to have a thrilling battle with Puzur, which I ended with just 2 HP. This little playtesting session also showed me that the Gaster Blasters feel good to dodge, which I should have checked earlier, to be honest. But despite advocating for a methodical approach, I often work quite unorganized, jumping from file to file and getting distracted by Discord, or in this case, CYF. Anyways, after looking through some of the other folders the mod came with, I realized that I also needed to copy the sprites and sounds alongside the WAV file over to my own mod. After doing so, I tried if the WAV worked in my own mod, and it did. At this point, I realized that it would have been easier to just duplicate the entire mod folder the library came with. It would have saved me some time, but oh well. If you're a smarter thinker than me, then use this to your advantage. It could save you precious seconds. With all the files in place, I decided to modify the wave to make it my own. This saves time, as the basics are already implemented and I just need to modify them. For instance, I adapted the original author's method of spawning timed blasters. However, in doing so, I soon realized that the library had a pretty big limitation. Gaster blasters could only point in four directions. Up, down, left and right. No diagonal blasters were possible. I was kind of embarrassed that I didn't realize this earlier, despite having looked at the functions. At this point, I could have searched for a new library, but instead decided to embrace the limitations. I didn't really know what to work on, so this wasn't a big deal for me. But if you already have a clear vision in mind and a library doesn't fit your needs, don't be afraid to toss it out for a different one. After some thinking, I had a little idea for a wave. Blast is coming from the top, left and right with random offsets. I also wanted the blasters to turn red when firing. 
I specifically chose a simple wave, since I knew that I had to explain it in the video and didn't want another part 6.2 again. Also, things that seem quite simple can be surprisingly difficult to create once you actually start working on them. But luckily, setting this up was pretty easy. All I had to do was choose a random direction and then decide on a random x or y value, depending on the blaster's rotation. Nothing else to really talk about here. The slightly bigger challenge was to tint the blasters red. The method I used was to loop through all the spawned blasters to check if they had fired already. To make my life easier, I copied the for loop I wrote in part 5 for this. Don't be afraid to reuse your code. In fact, I greatly encourage you to do so. Since I had completely forgotten the syntax of for loops, it was nice that I could rely on my previous work. This doesn't mean that I'm a noob programmer, even though I kinda am. I just forget the basics of a language if I haven't worked with it for a while. I can always look it up again when I need it, so does it really matter? Anyways, to check if a blaster had fired already, the library had a function called check fired. To get all spawned blasters, I looked into the library file and found that they were all stored in a table called bullets. How convenient! For the color change, I had to look at the documentation, because I forgot how to properly set the color of a sprite. One control F later and I had found what I needed. Just like with for loops, I hadn't worked with sprites for a while at this point. So I'm thankful for CYF's comprehensive documentation, which made it easy to find the info I was looking for. And with that, I was done. I decided to try out another library to make things more interesting. For my second library, I chose Ali Tally Scaster Blaster library. This time, I had to think about how to give credits since Ali demanded so. My solution was to create a credits.txt in the mod folder and link the GitHub page for the library there. Speaking of GitHub, it's a popular site to use for programmers, so you should familiarize yourself with it if you want to get serious. All you need to know for now is that the code button can provide you with an easy way to download stuff from there. GitHub also allows you to display a readme file, which Ali used for some basic documentation. This makes my life easier, as I can simply read what each function does and which are available. I downloaded the library and had to copy the resources into my own mod directly, since they weren't provided inside of a mod already. Because I had already used another library, my files became unorganized, with two sprite folders and two library files, which had almost identical names. Organization is key when you're dealing with larger projects, so I'm not really setting a good example here. After the setup was done, I played around with the library for a bit and was confused when my blasters were appearing in the bottom left corner of the screen. That's when I realized that this library used absolute coordinates, meaning 0, 0 is at the bottom left of the screen instead of the arena center. This is something I liked more about the other library, since it also had an option to spawn blasters with absolute coordinates if you wanted to. This shows that no solution in programming is ever perfect and there will always be compromises. That's why it's good to experiment with different libraries first to see which works best for you. It can really benefit you in the long run. With Ali's library, I decided to remake the wave I had made with the first library, with one big change. Since Ali's library could rotate blasters freely, I wanted them to come from all around the top of the arena at various angles. However, this required some more advanced math. I won't go into that much detail, but here's a general rundown of how I figured out the required formula. Firstly, I copied code once again. This time, it was from part 6.2, where I recreated one of Flower's attack patterns. It was the perfect base to start from, since the bullets appear in a circle and I wanted the blasters to spawn in a semicircle. Once again, this saved time, as I only had to rewrite a bit of code instead of writing it all from scratch. I once again used the random value for the direction, between minus 90 and 90 to be precise, and then fed that to a sine and cosine function for the x and y coordinates respectively. To figure out what the correct input for those functions were, I used Desmos, an online graph calculator. If you've watched part 6.2, this should look familiar. I actually used it for some crash course footage in that part. I started with the sine function to figure out the x coordinate. I experimented around until the bottom and top of the sine function was located at x minus 90 and x 90 respectively. I treated the result of the sine as a scale for the offset, 
meaning that the blasters have the most distance from the center of the arena when the sine function is at 1 or minus 1. Then I just multiply this value with the arena's width to get the final x coordinate. I did the same for the cosine function, which I used to the y coordinate and got my final locations. Then I added some random rotation offset, so that all blasters wouldn't just fire to the center of the arena. At this point, due to absolute coordinates, my blasters would still fire at the bottom left corner of the screen, so I figured out the arena's offset and stored that in two variables to make my life easier. With that, I was done with the positioning, which wasn't particularly difficult, but still more work than I anticipated. On the other hand, adding the color change for the blasters was much easier. The library had a built-in event function called onBeam, which executes when a blaster fires. So all I had to do was to create this function with the exact name inside of update and change the blaster's color to red the same way I did before. This is much easier and more efficient, since I don't need to loop through all of the blasters every frame. With that, the final wave was done. Is it fair? Not by a long shot. It's not even very fun. But it's a good way to showcase what the libraries can do, so I decided to conclude the learning experience here. I had successfully used two libraries and was now ready to share this learning experience with you. And with those words, the last part of my Unitair crash course comes to an end. It's been quite the journey, hasn't it? This series has helped many people, which I am very happy about. I'm always glad to read encouraging comments and now I'm actually somewhat sad to end this series. But all good things must come to an end eventually, so let's not dwell on the past and look into the future. With this series done, I want to finally return to game development. I have a lot of ideas for small prototypes and larger games that I want to make a reality. They will ask questions like, can we design survival games differently and more punishing? And how can we effectively generate 600 million square miles of unique rooms? I hope you will join me on this quest. But whatever you do, take care and have fun. For the last time in this series, see ya then and creator out.